الشيطان الرجيم وما أنزلنا عليك الكتاب إلا لتبين لهم الذي اختلفوا فيه وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين Today إن شاء الله تعالى I'll be talking to you briefly about three problems three observations first that I have noticed in the last 15 years of trying to teach Muslims uh, about the Qur'an. Uh, and what has basically been my motivation for trying to d address issues in the Qur'an, the way in which that I do. I think a lot of you in the audience are familiar with at least one or two of my lectures and probably finished half of them before falling asleep. But if you have heard enough lectures or heard one or two of them, then I'd, I'd just like to give you an overview of what is behind the scenes of these talks and this effort and this study. The first attitude that I have noticed among many, many Muslims, uh, and before I noticed it in anyone else, it was actually an attitude that I had myself. So I know that it exists because it's personal. Is that the Qur'an is not relevant. That the Qur'an is not talking about my life. It's talking about something that happened a long time ago. The people that I know that talk about the Qur'an look like they belong 500 years ago. They don't look like modern people. Uh, these people when they speak, they speak in a way that nobody else speaks. My friends don't talk like this. My colleagues at work don't talk like this. My, my professors at school don't talk like this. As soon as, and it, as a matter of fact, you could be friends with a khatib. And when you're talking to them, they talk to you perfectly normally. But as soon as they get up on the mimbar, they talk differently. They talk like there's, they belong in a different time. And it becomes almost disconnected from you. So the first impression I had of religious conversation, Qur'an, Sunnah, the whole bit, the whole thing, was that this does not belong in this time. This is some old thing. And this is for people that are old-minded. They're not, you cannot have this religion and live in modern times. You cannot combine those two things. It's impossible. That's number one. And as a matter of fact, even in so many lectures that I heard, all they talked about was how bad these times are and how good the old times used to be. That's all they talk about is these times are very bad and old times were very, very good. And so I say to myself, well, old times are over. So I guess it's bad now, so what's the point? <laughs> That's the first problem. The second problem I noticed, again, something I noticed in myself, and then I noticed it in now millions of other people, is that this religion and this book is extremely strict, and it's harsh, and it's difficult, and it has rules that are not easy. The rules of this book, the guidelines of this book, that it tells you to do some things that you're not supposed to do, or it, it forbids you from some things, or it commands you to other things, but its rules are too many, and too heavy, and too difficult, and basically impractical. You can't do it. You just can't do it. If you have to do it, you have to be a very extreme person. You cannot be a normal, happy person and do these rules. As a matter of fact, the more religious you get, the more depressed you get and the more angry you get and the more angry you look so all the religious people I know are really angry people so I don't want to be like that so that must be because of this religion this religion is harsh so it makes people harsh it makes people difficult it makes people very angry as a matter of fact in my own life before I turned to the deen of Allah I was born a Muslim but you know you know how it is if I saw a guy with a beard, I ran the other way. I do not want to be around those guys, because they keep telling me how I'm going to hell. Or they're just going to tell me to do something, like go make salat. Or, hey brother, why do you have this? Why, do you, why are you dressed like that? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you... Stop. I don't want to talk to you. Just leave me alone. Let me eat pizza. You know? 
You're, you're sitting there relaxing, eating your pizza. The guy with the beard walks into the restaurant. You're like, oh, God. <sighs> I was enjoying my meal. This guy had to come in here. You know? So the, the religion is harsh, and people that follow the religion are also harsh. That was the second attitude. The third attitude was that every time I hear, or at least most of the times when I heard people talk about the deen of Allah, they did not tell me why I should be Muslim. They did not tell me why I should be Muslim. They only told me that I should be Muslim. Here's what you should do. And if I said, why should I do it? They said, because you're going to burn in hell if you don't do it. Why should I believe I shall burn in hell? Don't question why you should believe it will burn in hell. You're a kafir if you question. You have doubts? You don't have iman? And if you go to the, the person who gave you that lecture and you say to them, so how do we know, how do we know for sure that this is the right religion? How do we know? I mean, there's so many religions in the world. How do we know that we have the right religion? The shaykh will tell you, and he told me, you son, you need to make wudu, then you make, need to make two rak'ah, because you're getting waswasa from shaitan. After I make wudu and I make two rak'ah, I still have the same question. Why are we following this religion? Every time I ask that question, people say, Astaghfirullah al azim how can you ask that question? You're not supposed to ask that question. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi. Do your parents know about this? Akhil Kareem, sit down, sit down. Let me do some ruqya on you. <laughs> but then after the ruqya is done, I still have the same question. So you know what I started thinking? And millions of young people around the world started thinking? These people don't have an answer to that question. These people, number one, they want you to live like you live, that this, they don't want you to live in 2015, they want you to live in 1275. They want you to live in the time of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. That was number one, it's irrelevant for this time. Number two, they're extremely harsh. And number three, they don't want to answer my questions. They think my questions are evil. These three reasons are enough, more than enough, for someone to want nothing to do with Islam. If you have these three concerns, and you want nothing to do with Islam, I appreciate that, I understand. It's logical. And I can tell you, with a good degree of confidence, I have not been to any country in the world Muslim or non-Muslim, where there are not people who think exactly like this. For all the people who come and sit in a lecture, there are hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people, Muslim and non-Muslim, who have this problem. They have this problem. And so this is what I noticed for so long. And I stayed away from the Qur'an for so long in my life, for one reason. It doesn't have to do with my time. It's harsh. It's not going to answer my questions. How are my questions? I have questions. I went to college in New York City. I took a philosophy class. And in philosophy class, and in psychology class, and in anthropology class, when, I've, when I'm studying Freud, when I'm studying you know, evolution, when I'm studying you know, modern European philosophy, how is a book 1400 years ago going to answer my questions? Come on, seriously? It's not going to have answers to my questions, you know. So I have no reason to go to this book. But by the gift of Allah, for no other reason, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ When I did stumble upon the book of Allah, when I did start to decide to try to understand the book of Allah, and I was fortunate enough to find some incredible, incredible teachers, I realized all three of those things were untrue. The book is incredibly relevant. The book has answers to my questions and my problems and my personal problems today. Forget about society's problems and the world's problems. That's, second, that's stage two and stage three. I'm talking stage one, my personal problems. It has answers. The second issue was it's harsh. The more I studied the book, I realized people are harsh, but the book is not harsh. <coughs> Allah sent the book as a rahmah. 
but we don't have rahma. So when we talk about the book, we talk about the book, but we take out the rahma. <laughs> That's what we do. Allah's book doesn't do that, we do that. Okay, we're intolerant. We're intolerant. And well, I'll talk about that a little bit later, some more. And then the third problem was that, it, you know, people don't want to answer my questions. I have questions and they say, Astaghfirullah, this is from shaitan. But the Qur'an says, Hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. The Qur'an is inviting people to ask questions and bring their criticisms. Which religion in the world says, please, criticize? No other religion other than Islam. Please, we would invite you to question and criticize this book. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ بِدُونِ اللَّهِ I'm reading this and I'm saying, how can a book do that? I thought this book is supposed to tell me, just believe. And if you don't believe, you will burn. But this book says, no, think for yourself. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ No other religion tells you to think. Actually, every other religion tells you, stop thinking and just believe. Stop thinking and just believe. And this book says, you cannot stop thinking. You have to think, and if you think, only then you will believe. There's no other religion like that. So I realized at the age of 19 that I had been cheated by the Muslim Ummah. I felt cheated. I had been Muslim my entire life, and nobody told me that this book actually has the answers, that this book is actually relevant, that this book isn't harsh. So the people around me that I thought will teach me the religion of Islam, they misrepresented its teachings. Personally, I felt very offended. I lost a lot of trust. I did. I didn't trust these people. I wanted to learn it for myself. I, I, I'm, not say, I'm not blaming everybody who teaches the deen of Allah, but enough people. <laughs> enough people. And I was fortunate enough to find some incredible, incredible teachers, scholars, that actually, in my opinion, understood the deen in the spirit that it's supposed to be understood. But these people are very few. And you know what, what else? These teachers that I'm talking about, they're not good speakers. <laughs> you have to go to them and learn from them. But if, they, if I show you a YouTube video of theirs, you'll go to sleep. So you have to go to them. And the people that misrepresented Islam to me, they were very good speakers. They were very good speakers. They're widespread. This is a problem. We keep talking about doing da'wah to non-Muslims. I am here to tell you, the Ummah itself is disconnected from the Qur'an. And actually a lot of times when the people are hearing about the Qur'an, they are hearing a message that is harsh, that is irrelevant, and that does not answer their questions. Even though the Qur'an answers the questions, the person presenting it doesn't present it that way. And so we are misrepresenting, or under, no, let's not say misrepresenting, we are under-representing the Book of Allah. We are underrepresenting the Book of Allah. That is the problem that I see before me. That's the challenge of our time. That to me is the biggest challenge of our time. Things are said about the ayat of Allah. The easy, it's easy to quote an ayah of Quran. Very easy. It's not difficult. And it's also extremely easy to misuse an ayah of the Quran. It's very easy. And people do it. And you know what? Sometimes people misuse the ayat of Qur'an and innocent people die. This Qur'an, if you misuse it, it will not just create fasad on the earth. It will create, you know, وَيَسْفِكُدْدِمَا The angels had a concern. It'll spill blood. The Qur'an can be used or misused to spill blood. And it's happening. The Qur'an can be misused to push people away from Islam. It's happening. It's happening in our time. People are reciting, the, people that are talking about Qur'an, they're talking about it in a way that even the Muslim says, I don't want Islam anymore. I want to walk away from it. This is the tragedy of our time. Now, that was the tragedy part. I'm going to stop talking about the tragedy now. You heard enough about the tragedy. Now I'm going to start over. I'm going to talk to you about an ayah of the Qur'an. Wallahu anzala minas sama ima'an. Allah, in fact, He is the one that sent water from the sky. Allah is talking about rain, yes? Now bear with me. فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Then He gave life to the earth after the earth was what? 
The earth was dead. Allah gave life to the earth after the earth was dead. What did Allah use to give life to the earth? Water. In the example, Allah gave water to the earth, and that, that way the dead earth comes back to life. Without the rain, does this planet survive? This planet cannot survive without rain. That is the life of this planet. Everybody clear about that? Okay, now let's move forward. يُنْبِدُ لَكُمْ بِهِ الزَّرْعُ وَالزَّيْتُونَ وَالنَّخِيلُ وَالْأَعْنَابُ وَمِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ Both of these ayat belong to Surah An-Nahl. Allah produces for you, by using the water, Allah produces two kinds of things. Let me categorize the two kinds of things. He produces farm and, you know, zaytun. You know what zaytun is? Good, olive, very good. And then what's What's nakhil? Sisters know Arabic vocabulary. Guys are getting some good sleep. Like, <laughs> I knew that one. When, when Three. Three zero. Anab. Women gulli thamarat. Four zero. All kinds of fruits. Now listen. On the one hand, you have farm and palm trees and grapes. These things don't grow by themselves. You have to take care of those trees and you have to grow a farm. A farm does not happen by itself. You have to put a lot of work into a farm for it to grow properly. You understand? Okay. Huh? and white Right. So now when Allah says all kinds of fruits, when He says all kinds of fruits, now if you go into like the South, South American jungles, or you go into Afri the Africas, will you see all kinds of fruits on the trees? Yeah, all kinds of fruits. But th are there farmers in those jungles? No, it goes on its own. What Allah is telling us is, He sends water from the sky, and when He sends water from the sky, there is some kind of fruits or vegetation that people have to farm. You have to take care of those plants. Unless you take care of them, they will not grow. And then there are some plants and some fruits that will grow on their own with no effort from you. That's out in the wild, yes? Two kinds of life on the earth come out from the rain. You understand the point so far? Okay. But actually, remarkably, the ayah that I shared with you, Wallahu anzala minas sama'i ma'an, is not actually about the water and the sky. That's its second purpose. Its primary purpose is dictated by the ayah that came before it. And the ayah that came before it is, وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا لِتُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ أَلَّذِ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ The previous ayah says, Allah sent the book from the sky. In the next ayah, He said, Allah sent the water from the sky. So if you want to understand the effect of the book of Allah on the earth, if you want to understand the effect of the book of Allah on the earth, you have to understand the effect of water on the earth. You understand? Now, what does water do? Water brings life to the earth. Is it essential for the survival of the earth? Yes. So, if the water is essential for the survival of the earth, the book of Allah properly delivered to all the places that are morally dead, that are spiritually dead. It has to be delivered properly, because rain has to come properly, especially to the places that are dead. It has to go to those places, and even if they have been dead for centuries, it will bring them back to life. So no matter how bad the situation is, no matter how dead the earth is, when water can bring the earth back to life, no matter how bad the political situation of the world is, no matter how bad the moral situation of the world is, how, no matter how bad the media is in any day and age, no matter how low the Muslims have become, this book has the power to bring people back to life. It has the power to do that. You understand? But when the water comes down, when the water comes down, there are two kinds of plants. Plants that grow on their own, and plants that you have to what? Are there people in the world that we ne I never met them. I never met them. I just made a YouTube video. 
And then they come to me and say, hey, I used to be Christian. I saw your video. I became Muslim. Then I told my family, and they became Muslim. Can we take a picture with you? I was like, yeah, can I take a picture with you? Did I do anything with them? No. That was the word of Allah somehow reaching them and they on their own grew. Yes? That is not because of our effort, that is because Allah grows in iman in the heart of whoever He wants. All I had to do was do a little bit, little bit, but Allah will spread it Himself. Allah will spread, actually about the rain, He says something beautiful. You are not the one who sends the water down. You're not the one who delivers it to the earth. I am not the one who will deliver the word of Allah into somebody's heart. I can only try to make some effort. The actual delivery is happening just like the rain. By who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is one very important difference. Please understand this difference. Water comes from the sky. Yes? And is there, does water come to the sky in one bucket and then you have to go deliver it? Or it goes everywhere on itself? It goes by itself. But when book, the book comes from the sky, it goes to one messenger. It comes to one man. And then he has to make the effort to what? Deliver it. And then the people he delivers it to, they have to, to make the effort to what? Deliver it more. Allah will not send the book to everyone. We have to deliver it. So un we have some similarity with the rain. The Quran has similarity with the rain. But there's a difference. The rain, we don't go and distribute it. By the way, if you made the Muslims responsible for distributing the rain on the earth, we would be an extinct species. <laughs> but we are responsible for delivering the word of Allah to the earth. Are we doing a good job? I would argue no. I would argue we're doing a pretty terrible job. I would argue we're doing a pretty terrible job even with Muslims. Forget non-Muslims. Because we make it seem harsh. We don't make it... The rain is supposed to be rahmah, not adab. But we present it as adab. Even ask a 10-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl, living in Pakistan, living in Bangladesh, living in Kuwait, living in Bahrain, living in America, living in Australia. A 10-year-old Muslim boy. What does the Qur'an say? Qur'an says lots of things are haram. And Allah gets very angry. Where did they learn that from? Their parents. We, we teach harshness from the beginning. We heard the recitation. Allah introduced the teaching of the Qur'an with which name? Ar-Rahman Allam al-Qur'an. Fa'ayna ar-Rahma fi ta'lim al-Qur'an. You know, this is the problem. It's a very serious problem. So we have to address this issue. Now, on the one hand, people will come on their own to Islam like wild fruits. And they're amazing. They're amazing people. But that does not mean da'wah is happening. Because we didn't do the farming. On the other side, there is the farm, yes? Now let me tell you something else. Very interesting. Allah gives these analogies. Examples are critical in the Quran. Examples are a fundamental of the Quran. Now, farming. Did you know that human civilization, human beings, in the study of anthropology, human civilization, the first act of human civilization was farming. And the argument is humanity would not have survived as a civilization. We could have survived in caves or woods or something, but as a civilization with cities and countries and infrastructure, none of that would have happened if we did not farm. And farming would never have happened if we did not deliver a means of uh, 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 irrigation, of channeling water. If you don't figure out how to channel water, you cannot farm. And if you cannot farm, you will not have civilization. Is that an important thing to understand in this conversation? If we don't understand how to deliver Qur'an, and if we don't understand how to cultivate people, then the Muslim civilization will cease to exist. It will die. Have previous nations that were given a book died before us? They have. It's not impossible. 
It's not impossible. The only thing is, if we don't do this job, Allah wants this job to get done. So if you are no good, in tatawallaw, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum, thumma la yakunu amthalakum. If you turn away, He will just replace you with some other people and they won't be, I'll use Urdu, they won't be nikamme like you. They won't be useless like you. They'll actually do the job. If we don't do our job, Allah does not need us. Wallahu al-ghani wa antum al-fuqara. You don't do your job, Allah will replace you. You are not special to Allah because you are, you know, uh, Muslims for centuries. You're not special to Allah. That means nothing. The Banu Israel are much older as an ummah than we are. Much older. <coughs> We've only been an ummah for 1400 something years. They were a chosen ummah for thousands of years. Thousands of years. And even then, even though they were so senior, when they turned away, did Allah replace them? Yep. Yep. You're not special, I'm not special. We can be replaced. The job is what is important, not you, not me. The job is important. Now let's talk about that job. My argument is that today, the only solution, the only thing that can bring life back spiritual life, moral life, ethical life, back to the Muslims, and by the way, by extension to the entire world, because the entire world needs it. The only thing that can bring life back to this earth is the Book of Allah. The humanity needs it. You know, they have conventions about environmental crisis. They have conventions about political crises. There are, you know, United Nations, uh, you know, charters, they meet about all kinds of humanitarian drastic situations that are happening all over the world. The crisis situations in the world keep growing and growing and growing and growing. If you're watching CNN 24 hours a day, you are listening to human tragedy 24 hours a day. Human news is just tra tragedy, that's all it is. Which means the earth is dying. And Allah told us the only thing that can bring it to life and save its life is what? The Book of Allah. The problem though is some people who are who want to further kill are using the book of Allah. <laughs> They're using the book of Allah not to spread life, but to spread death. To spread death. And they claim that they have the right understanding of the book of Allah. And I argue the following. Here's, why we, here's how we as an ummah have to fix this problem. Nothing, please listen to this carefully, it's gonna sound Politically incorrect, it's gonna sound controversial, some of you will be offended, but I don't care. La nakhafu fillahi Nothing is above the Book of Allah. Wa kalimatullahi hiyal ulya. Nothing is above the Book of Allah. Unfortunately, in our times, sometimes you and I have an idea, we already have an idea. And now we want that idea to be justified by the Book of Allah. So we develop our idea first, and then we find the leel in the Book of Allah. What was on top? Quran or your idea? Your idea, and you put the ayat underneath it to justify. The ayat of Allah are now being used to justify your philosophy. You are not extracting the philosophy and the thinking and the solution from the Book of Allah. You already have the solution. You just want to justify it from the Book of Allah. This is a disservice to the Qur'an. For example, there are people who talk about the mission of the Qur'an is da'wah. Where did you get this from? I don't know, but the mission of the Qur'an is da'wah. So if, what, what, what about the ayat of talaq? What about the ayat of taking care of your parents? What about, no, no, yeah, those are important, but the real mission is da'wah. So you decide which ayat are the real mission and which ayat are the... Uh. How do you decide? Where did you come from? Who are you to put that rule on top of Allah's book? Da'wah is part of Allah's book's mission. It's not the only mission. It's not the only teaching. I was recently giving a khutbah on Surah Al-Mujadala and I said, look, every surah is a curriculum from Allah. Every surah is a khutbah from Allah, a sermon, a maw'idah from Allah, yes? 
And Allah knows what is most important, what is next, what is next, what is next. What He mentions first is the most important thing. Then He mentions what comes next, what comes next. Like any teacher does, the most important lessons come first. Surah Al-Rahman, we just heard the recitation. What's the most important part of Surah Al-Rahman? Al-Rahman wa'allam al-Qur'an. Everything else is what? Second. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا يَكُونُ مِنْ أَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ وَلَا أَدْنَى مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرَ إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كَانُوا Wait, Najwa means people conspire against the Prophet ﷺ. People are conspiring sometimes to undermine the Prophet's mission. Sometimes they're conspiring, they're making conspiracy secret meetings to kill the Prophet ﷺ. That's a pretty serious problem. But in Surah Al-Mujadala, that is problem number what? Two. What was problem number one? A woman has a problem with her husband. What? No, no, no. Yeah, that's a spot. The real issue is Najwa. Who are you to decide? Allah teaches the way He wants to teach. I, I'm reminded of the question Allah asks in Surah Al-Hujurat. قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ Oh, you're going to teach Allah your deen? You're going to teach Him your deen? You decide what's more important. You know? So we, what we do is we take selections of ayat. These are the important ayat. These are the ayat that we have to have our curriculum with. The rest of Qur'an is secondary. Even if you don't say it, you're thinking it. And that thinking is problematic. We have to give justice to the Book of Allah. We have to give justice to a surah. We have to stop thinking that some things are important and some things are less important. There are some things that are in order, there's priorities, but those priorities are not decided by you. They're not decided by me. They've already been decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have already been decided. Now think about this. Now, this is the last thing I'll share with you and I'm done. Then I just want to hear from you guys. When I was in New York, when I was not a religious person, I was a Muslim, not a religious person. When I first got exposed to Islam, the thing about New York is it's a crazy place. Every masjid has its own Islam. Literally, every masjid has its own Islam. You know, كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ This is actually, I saw it in New York. Every group believes they are the right one, and they will give you a lot of khutbah and a lot of lectures about how wrong the next door neighbor is. And then when you go to that one, they will tell you how perfect they are, and how evil those guys are. And I have a problem that I like to go, when I learn something, I like to really learn it. So I go to group number one and I learn so much from them that I become part of them. And then I say, okay, I've learned enough. Now I'm going to go to group number two and I'm going to learn so much from them, I'll become part of them. I know it's crazy, but I did that. <laughs> so I went from one group to another group to another group to another group. I went through, I, I was a tourist. Okay. And when I was done, I realized something. I realized something. Every group decides one thing is the most important thing. And their entire picture of Islam is based on that one concept. One group says the most important thing is da'wah. Forget everything else. Another group says the most important thing is how you look. You should look a certain way. If you don't look like this, then you're not a good Muslim. Another group says, no, you have to have these, these books. If you don't go through these books, then you're not a good Muslim. You don't really know your Islam. And they're not talking about Qur'an, by the way. There are other secondary books. If you don't have those books, then you're not a real Muslim. Every group has certain curriculum. That's, the mo that's what defines their Islam. And not a single group said, you know, the curriculum for the Muslim should be what? The book of Allah. وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَا by the way, did every one of those groups quote something from the Qur'an? Yes, but that was, not, that was only to justify their position. And that was only to prove that the other guys are going to hell. That was the only reason. Why would Allah give us this book and say, Why? This book, if you give it justice, it will cause union. And if you don't give it justice, it will cause Division. We're not holding on the way we're supposed to. I'll tell you, you know, uh, to make that last point that I just made, 
which was that we have to think beyond groups. We have to think of ourselves as Muslims. We have to think of ourselves as Muslims. And we have to bring normalcy back to the Ummah. The only way to do it is again putting the Book of Allah in its place, in its proper place. I'll tell you a small story. I was giving a lecture in Birmingham, England. And if you've been to Birmingham, England, uh, make a istighfar. But anyway, I was giving a lecture in Birmingham, England, and Birmingham is a very interesting place. The, the mas there's a few masajid there, and every masjid is very different from every other masjid. These people hate each other's guts. The only time they agree with each other is when they have to get a halal burger. <laughs> other than that, they do not like to see each other's face. You know, they, don't, they completely hate one another. They're different schools of thought. I don't, I'm not here to name names. I, I know their names, the group names, but I don't care. I, I think that is so useless that I don't even bring, pull it out of my mouth. That's why I don't name those groups. Khair. So there was about 2,000 people in the audience. 1,000 to 2,000 people in the audience. And I was, giving an, I was explaining a, one of the stories from the Qur'an. And a young man and a woman came up to me. Salaman, can we talk to you for a second? I said, yeah. Uh, we are actually uh, Baha'i. We're Baha'i. You know, Baha'is believe in some really out there stuff. But they still consider themselves Muslims. We, we, we're Baha'i, and um, we really love listening to your lectures. It, helps us, it helped us change a lot. We didn't know the Qur'an tells these things. We wanted to come here, but we're really scared. Because if people find out here who we are, I think there's going to be a problem. And we brought 20 of our friends here too. But we just want you to know quietly that we appreciate what you're doing. I was like, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. And I'm really happy you're here. I'm done with that conversation. And the guy comes up, brother, I know this is a Sunni program, but I'm Shia. Is that okay? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Because my, my Shia friends and I, we listen to your lectures. I was like, that's cool. Keep it up. Very nice. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, I won't tell anybody. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I have had Christians come up to me and tell me. We've been watching your videos. I was in Canada. I was at an RIS convention. A group of Canadian women came up to me. Numinally can, right? I was like, yeah. <laughs> We're a group of Christian women. We've been studying the Quran for the last year with you. And we only came to this convention because we wanted to thank you. It's helped us change a lot. Christian women studying the Book of Allah. May Allah guide them. You know, if I was still wearing my group labels, those stickers from New York, as soon as I saw a Baha'i, I was like, hey, come here, let me talk to you a bit. Fix you. If I saw Christians, I would go straight after Jesus. If I saw the Shia, I would go straight after their aqaid and the ikhtilafat. Go, I would attack them right away. I would do that. But you know what? I understand something from the Book of Allah. We are supposed to be farmers. We are supposed to be what? Farmers. A farmer puts a seed in the ground. Then he puts water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. Then he puts water on top. Then he cleans the soil. Then he puts the water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. Then he removes the insects. Then he puts the water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. And for months and months and months and months and months, he sees nothing. He sees nothing because the seed is where? Under the ground. And he doesn't get angry. Hey! Why aren't you growing? Let me pull it on, let me... That is not how things grow. You have to let things grow. All you have to do is provide the water. And Allah's responsibility, I don't grow a plant. Allah grows the plants. Allah grows the... Why did He give us this analogy? You have to spread the book of Allah and Allah will make the changes. You just have to spread the book of Allah. You're not responsible to change people. Lasta alayhim bi musaytir. You're not in charge. Stop pretending that you're in charge. So many people come up to me, brother, mashallah, you give some good da'wah. Tell me how I can tell my brother to start praying. Tell me what I can tell him. I was like, 
I don't know what to tell you. Because maybe you haven't put enough water, not put enough water yet. And maybe you're putting water, but some plants grow slowly and some plants grow quickly. It's not about what you say. It's how patient you are with people. It's how patient you are. Yusuf alayhi salam's sons, or Yaqub alayhi salam's sons, they disobeyed their father or no? They were a source of sadness or no? For years and years and years, they are a source of sadness. And at the end of it all, they make tawbah or no? They take their time, yeah? Some, some seeds take a long time to come out. Fasabrun jameel. Yaqub alayhi salam doesn't turn to Allah, Ya Allah, give me something I can say to my sons so they can change. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We are impatient with each other. We want changes to come like that quickly. If the best generation took 23 years, first of all, we're not the best generation. But if they took 23 years of exposure to this book, our challenge today is let's re-expose the people to the Book of Allah like they've never experienced it before. So they can remove the assumptions that they've had about the Book of Allah. Non-Muslims have misconceptions about the Qur'an and my conclusion is Muslims have misconceptions about the Qur'an. We have to fix the misconceptions for the entire world. We have to show the, the world how beautiful, how remarkable, how incredible, how loving, how merciful, how addictive this book is. That's what we have to do. May Allah Azza wa help us do our job. And may Allah Azza wa increase our love and affection for the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallahu Thank you so very much.